Let's get ludicrous. All this and more on This Week in Retro. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. The triad rise again. A restoration even I could do. Don't have a cow man. Bart reaches 50 with retro help. That was the worst Bart Simpson impression ever. All of this and more coming up on today's show. It's This Week in Retro. Up to date news for out of date tech. Hello, chaps. I hope you've had another good week and managed to squeeze some retro into your lives this week. Um, I've had a good week, but before we start off, we should mention that this will be the last show. Dramatic pause for about three weeks, not ever. Uh, for about, is, is it three weeks? Is that right? Three weeks. Uh, we're, three we weeks. air we're again on the shows 15th missed. of October. Yeah. Yeah. 15th right, of October. So we we'll be back again. on the 15th of October um, because as much as we uh, try our best with this show, we are absolutely useless without Duncan and it's time for Duncan to have a little break. So uh, we'll be back when he's back and um, I, I hope he has a nice time off and we should probably take the opportunity to say thank you, Duncan, for all the hard work that you do on this show. It, it really does make the show what it is. So big thumbs up to Duncan. We sometimes make it difficult for Duncan as well because we, we are... Do amateurs yeah <laughs> sometimes this week being one of them <laughs> so uh this week i i was uh down in exeter for a wedding and i found myself with a couple of hours to spare so uh, i took the trip to a place called the boneyard arcade in the center of exeter little retro arcade that's appeared there it's been there for about uh, a year and um, I thought I could maybe just sort of sneak in and play a few games. But I was I was recognized by Phil, who gave me a very warm welcome. Him and his brother run the arcade. And um, I had a great time, I have to say. It's, um, it's quite a small arcade, but you really can't complain because it's just five pounds to get in. They laid you up with a, like an NFC card, uh, which is five pounds for 20 credits. You tap that on, on the machine to put your coin in, your virtual coin. And... Um, it's quite a nice way of doing it because it, it really makes you think twice about what games you want to spend your credits on. Just like it did back in the day when you had a limited amount of 20p's in your pocket, you're having to make those decisions again. Um, and my decisions were some pinball, some um, Point Blank, really enjoyed Point Blank, um, Sega Rally, Scramble, and Star Wars, and a couple of others. I, I stayed away from the dance machines, which were extremely popular. DDR was there. Yeah, not really my thing, but I know these these machines have their audience, and they were certainly there in their in their numbers on a Saturday night. Um, so yeah, Boneyard Arcade, worth a look, worth a look. Um, Chris, what have you been up to this week? Uh, well, it was the wife's birthday uh, last Saturday, so we did an escape room, a space themed escape room, which was great. Except that we all forgot how an airlock works. Uh, don't want to give too much away because um, it is in Perth, and people in Perth <laughs> do listen. So if they want to go to that, uh, but we were literally stuck in the first part of this room for about ten minutes, not being able to get through to the next section, and we have to had to ask for our first clue without even advancing through one single door, which was, yeah, a bit bit unfortunate but um yeah we got through that so that was good actually finished the whole room in the end um with only with three minutes to spare so that was that was fine um but also an, an escape um, room an yeah. escape room in space was it yeah yeah it was actually really cool yeah you have to get all the systems back online and escape the aliens and all that kind of stuff yeah it was, mm. it was quite cool yeah yeah got multiples no no there. lonely dinosaurs up there i didn't spot any no no, I didn't. No. I, I was on the lookout for them, <laughs> clearly. Um, there were no <laughs> no lonely dinosaurs in space. <laughs> didn't see them. Um, but also, I don't know if you remember, um, not long ago, both yourself and I, Neil, we confessed to not really making use of our A500 minis. Um, and interestingly, I've, uh, I've got a family staying with us at the moment, and this room, gorgeous though it is, it actually doubles up as the guest room. So I do lose easy access to my retro computers. So the A500 Mini came into its own. It literally went into the front lounge, plugged into one of the main TVs, and it did what it's designed to do, which is sit in front of a modern TV and let me have some casual retro gaming with ease. So, yeah, really good, really good use case of it. Um, other than that, I, I know it sounds silly, but I'm actually a big fan of Pirate Day or International Talk Like a Pirate Day, <laughs> as it's actually known. Um, and it's sort of become a tradition now to celebrate it in some way. I kind of, I've now ended up, 
cheekily celebrating it over the whole weekend. So I've got some marinated octopus I'm chowing into. Won't eat, eat any right now because I'll be chewing for half the show. And I, I must confess, I am drinking some wonderful locally distilled rum as well. So, um, yeah, that's how I celebrate it these days. Yep. What about yourself, Dave? What have you been up to? For, for the pilot day, absolutely nothing. <laughs> uh, the glasses have come off. I'm nervous. Uh-oh. What's he? Uh-oh. What's he? I, oh, oh, oh! He's got oh, his eye look patch at on. That. <laughs> there you go. He's put an eye patch on his glasses. <laughs> I like it. I like it. it. But isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? It's not Pirate Day. It's Talk Like a Pirate Day, isn't it? It is Talk Like a Pirate Day. We used to it, yeah. Work for, yeah. We haven't done it for a while. Now. We used to have big morning teas at work and everything. But um, on Pirate Day hope- this year, actually, that's when um, uh, Return to Monkey Island dropped, wasn't it? So, did you have you either of you two guys buy it? No, not because I have anything against it, just because I'm hanging in there for a physical version. I really want to buy a boxed copy to oh, put with enough. all the other boxed, the old versions. So I'd, I'd like to hope that will come about one day. But um, if not, I will I will crumble and I will buy it on Steam, I'm sure. No. Yeah. Dave, did you buy it? I know you're a huge point-and-click adventure fan. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet, but I'm, I'm sure I will at some point. I, I've promised myself for modern games, I'm only going to buy them when I'm ready to play them there and then. Yes. Otherwise, I end up with these great big lists and Steam and GOG of all my, all these games that I bought because I thought they were a bargain. Yeah, fair enough. What have you been up to, Dave? Not much. Um, I'm still recovering. I'm still not great, but um, I, uh, I've been watching a lot of telly. I'm watching the... The, the new Lord of the Rings series, which is actually quite good. Uh, but there's a couple of stories I wanted to touch on that have been submitted to the subreddit. Um, as we know, you, you submit stories, people upvote them, we, we talk about them, and they didn't really they didn't really uh, match the stories we would talk about, but I felt that um, a stories we'd pick, but I felt we should mention them. One of them is, a, is kind of a follow-up to a story we did a couple of weeks ago about Japan having the war on floppy disks. And the guy that I asked for information is Tom Persky from floppydisk.com, and he's actually recently been interviewed, and someone submitted the interview about floppy disks to the subreddit. Go and read it. It's great. Uh, the other one is someone submitted uh, that they'd noticed Fat Boy Slim using Atari ST as if that was a, a big deal, and perhaps it's something that I, I, I've, I've uh, assumed everyone already knew, and it's clear they didn't, that... Um, the Atari ST was standard music studio equipment for a long time. It was it was an inexpensive, reliable. It had the two best pieces of software for arranging music, so it had Cubase and Notator. The, the timing on it was really precise, and the bass machine came out of the box with a superb high-resolution mode uh, and too many ports. So if you listen to electronic music in the 1990s, it was probably made on an Atari ST, along with an array of Akai samplers, drum machines, etc. But it was in the, in the heart of it. Um, and perhaps people aren't, aren't aware of it. There are still people out there who are using retro computers and retro samplers and drum machines and things like that to create new music. And I always love seeing those setups because that usually involves a great big rack with them all in there. Sometimes machines like an Atari ST have been converted into a rack mount case and slotted in there. And uh, it's just lovely to see people still using them to make new music. So that's awesome. Yeah. Should we get on with um, this week's stories? Let's do it. Let's do it. (laughs) Our first story this week was submitted by our good friend, Chrissy Baps. Hello, Chrissy. Thank you for sending this one in. And uh, it it came about um, thanks to big news on social media from the Rise of the Triad Twitter account, which made a post that reads as follows. It's time to get ludicrous again. The Hunt team is back. The original Rise of the Triad is being remastered by the one and only Night Dive Studio with help from the Mad Men at New Blood. Coming soon. And then it directs us to their website, getludicrous.com. Get Ludicrous being a a reference to the screams of ludicrous jibs in in the game when when body plots would fly everywhere. Hang on. Um, You said jibs. Is Sorry, it Gibbs or Gibbs? Oh, is it Gibbs. is it Gibbs? Gibbs. I, I, Gibbs. I always I think, think Gibbs. Gibbs. Oh no, it's Giblets. It's Giblets, isn't it? That, so it's, so it's Gibbs. Gibbs. It's Gibbs. I would yeah. say Giblets. Chris, you, you would say Giblets. Yeah. Giblets. 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 And I was Giblets. brought up in Kent, where people speak properly. So yeah, you know. get your you get your <laughs> Christmas turkey and you, you pull the Giblets out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gibbs. Gibbs. Gibbs, not Gibbs. Gibbering. Gibbs. Um. Post your angry answers in the, the comments, please. Yeah, don't cut that out of the show, Duncan. We'll leave that in there. I'm going to go with jibs. Yeah. Because you're wrong. Okay. 
So, um, yes, so the tweet directs us to their website, getludicrous.com, which is a reference to ludicrous jibs, which is screamed in the game when arms and things are flying everywhere. Um, and nothing to do with the 90s rap artist. Do you remember Do you remember Ludicrous? I can't remember what he sang, but I remember yeah. him. No. No? I remember no? him, but I don't remember okay. what he sang, no. No, me neither. Anyway, it's nothing to do with him, so let's not talk about him. Um, Rise of the Triad was released in 1995, published by Apogee Software, and originally it was supposed to be the follow-up to Wolfenstein 3D before it changed and became a game all of its own. So as such, it's based on an updated version of that original Wolfenstein game engine. Um, very much one of these 2.5D first-person shooters this is 95, so it's a year before the 3D chunky polygons of Quake uh, and all that. It's before even Duke Nukem, that came later in 96. Um, but it was certainly competing with an explosion of FPS games that, that were spewing forth um, after Doom uh, set the world on fire. So I'll admit that I haven't revisited Triad since the 90s, but I did enjoy it a lot at the time. Um, I don't think I ever hooked it up for multiplayer. I know it has got a good reputation for LAN play, but I, I never did that. It was all a, sing, a single player experience for me back in the day. Um, what I do remember about it was that it was just massively over the top. You would you would jump on a pad and bounce 100 foot into the air while shooting enemies, and it really didn't take itself seriously. Um, a lot of humor in the game. It, it, it was a gory game, but it had a lot of humor, very much in the same way that Duke Nukem would have the following year. So um some similarities there now chris i'm going to come to you first because i know you're a big fps fan so i'm going to take a guess that you did spend a lot of time playing this one <laughs> i'm going to be in, pro uh, in trouble because when i heard the title i was thinking yay sticky bomb and then as you're going through it i'm thinking no wait a minute that's shadow warrior <laughs> so do you know what <laughs> i don't believe i ever played rise of the triad i've heard no. the name heaps and heaps of times but I think we need to add this to the list of games that Chris has not played. I'm really sorry. Dave, I'm going to quickly handball over to you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Give it a go for 10 minutes. It's a bit of fun. It's oh, maybe yeah, not yeah. the best gameplay of, of that genre, but it's a bit of fun. And you're right, it's a bit like Shadow Warrior in that it's, it doesn't take itself seriously. Mm. The, the, the best thing about uh, Rise of Trial is dog mode. <laughs> you can turn into your dog. You can see a little tongue coming out. You can open doors with your little paw. Dog mode is great, and you can chew and bite. What? What? <laughs> you, what do you mean what? It's a perfectly natural thing to have in a first-person shooter turning into a dog. <laughs> dog mode is great. That's why you need to play Rise of Triad. Um, now, was this more or less technically advanced than Doom? I, I think Doom was... Ed's step up from the Wolfenstein engine. So did they did they send out the Wolfenstein engine and Apogee did a few enhancements to it, but not as much as Doom? Uh, is that right? Uh, I remember it being fast and smooth and really rapid, whereas Doom perhaps wasn't as fast. Yeah, I was surprised when I looked up, uh, read into it, and it said it was an updated Wolfenstein engine because we'd had Doom in between these two games. So why wouldn't hmm. they have built on that? But obviously yeah. reasons. But I know there was also a 2013 remaster of this, and, and it's not a remaster, sorry, it's a remake, I'm wrong, it's a remake in 2013, which did, I think, catch the character of the original, uh, but this time, though, this time it's a, a remaster, and I think we've said so many times that we prefer remasters rather than remakes. I think that remake used the Unreal Engine, thinking back they to all it, do. I can't remember, uh, yeah. But um, looking at the 2013 remake, I did see a review from IGN and it read the following. It's a relic from the early age of shooters that, while authentic, is so entrenched in outdated design and mechanics that it's more frustrating than it is fun. Now, uh, that's probably a fair comment because, of course, FPS games have moved on massively since 1995. But at the same time, a remake is a remake. You're not going to create a totally different game, mm. especially when it's a fan project um, and they're all making it out of their love for the original. So why would they change that? If they had made it as a modern FPS, then all it would have been with my, is my criticism of modern remakes is they make just the same generic game that everyone's playing just now with all the gameplay elements that people say they like and they slap some old IP on it and they say, here's your old game back again and it's not. Yeah, yeah, so I, yeah. I, I, I don't necessarily agree with IGN's criticism there. Well, I guess what that raises is another question, that criticism being in 2013. So if you add another nine years onto that and bring us forward to 2022, 
does the review line of outdated design and mechanics does that now give way to warm fuzzy feelings of nostalgia do we do we become more forgiving and accepting of what those games were uh, and less expecting of what they would be if they were remade as a new game in 2022 what do you think I, I think so. I mean, if you if you play something like Doom, you know, which is the obvious one to pick on the PS4, it plays absolutely fine if you are familiar with it in its original period. It's exactly what you would expect from a remaster, which is exactly what that port is. It's just made available on a modern system with higher resolution t- resolution textures than it originally had, but the gameplay and the maps and the and the mechanics are, remain unchanged, and it plays fantastically. Uh, and you get a new generation of players appreciating it for what it was originally even though they didn't realize they're seeing an enhanced version so i think it's great yeah well what we do know about this new version of rise of the triad is that it's being made by night dive studios with help from new blood interactive it's going to be published by apogee which is nice to see and the remaster will have all of the original episodes and all of the add-on packs built into it as well as a new episode created for especially for this release it will run in 4k it'll run at 60 frames per second the field of view of it is enhanced the um, heads-up display is modified just so it all works nicely in, in a widescreen format it all sounds very much like the remaster of blood blood fresh supply i don't know if you played that i, I enjoyed that when that came out back in 2019 and that's because it was the same studio. That was also Night Dive Studios who made that. Um, they also gave us Power Slave Exhumed. That came out in February of this year and is reviewed very well. So uh, they've worked on lots of other remasters, um, but those are the most closely aligned with Rise of the Triad that they've worked on. So, yeah, I, I think they're going to do a, a, a stunningly good job. Um, they've got a great track record on doing that. And... Um, yeah, I, I think whether you were a fan of the original or if you just want to see what the fuss was about, like people who jump into Doom on the Switch, as you were saying, just dipping into it to see what is this game of historical significance and how did it influence the genre? Well, here's an easy way to dive in with a, a Steam download and not having to mess around with emulators or anything like that. And you get to enjoy it in 4K at 60 frames per second. So look out for this one. Uh, Rise of the Triad um hang on what was the name of it rise of the triad ludicrous <laughs> ludicrous. ludicrous okay Still rise of the triad. Dogwood. ludicrous download it just for dog mode you can find it on steam or go to get ludicrous.com it may surprise you to hear that i don't retro bright um the, the fact is i'm scared that i'm gonna somehow mess it up and make things worse and i'm sure i'm not alone uh, but a contactless method has been pointed out by Reddit user Remington Noiseless. Are you advertising shavers or something? I don't know. But anyway, um, but I think this is a method that I would be comfortable with. Basically, you create a sealed chamber in a plastic tub and you place the shell of the computer or console or even you know individual part of choice within that chamber, but it's not touching any liquid at all. So basically, there's no basting with cream. There's no bagging of things, nothing like that. The hydrogen peroxide sits on the base of the tub, and all the parts you're treating sit raised on whatever you can find to raise them up on so that they're not sitting in the hydrogen peroxide. And it's actually the vapor when when the whole thing is sitting in the sun that does the magic. And it seems to work from the video example provided. Neil, I definitely, definitely remember you used this meth- method because I wouldn't forget a thing like this um, when you were restoring <laughs> the Amiga 1000, I think it was. And this has nothing to do with the fact that Dave reminded me that you have, in fact, used this method. <laughs> and I'd completely forgotten that you had. Um, so, yeah, how did it go? How did you find it? Yeah, um, I first tried this back in July um, and showed this in a video on the A1000 after seeing the thread on Twitter by Airgun. So that's at A. 3-R-G-A-N, well worth a follow. Um, So he just did a a thread of pictures of him trying out this. um, And I thought, okay, let's let's try this on the A1000 because it was an extremely yellow A1000. And the keyboard in particular was very yellow. So um, tried it out. Uh, It was just before the heat wave. So we had good weather, but it wasn't stinkingly hot. It wasn't so hot that you would worry about it because what you're doing is you're taking a box, you're um, you're pouring liquid peroxide in the bottom, then you're propping up your thing so it's not in the ball of peroxide, it's, it's lifted up off of that, and then you put the lid on. So it's sort of contained and the vapors waft around and do their thing. So if it's a really, really hot day, if it's 30 outside, 
30C, it's going to get really hot in that box. And, um, you know, I always worry about things not necessarily melting, but warping if they get a bit too much. So um, the, the, the weather was, you know, a decent temperature, did it outside, and it was very effective. Then we had the heat wave, and I was worried about how hot it was, and I wanted to tackle the keyboard. So um, I decided to devise an indoor method because I thought, well, this will be good for winter time as well. Um, which, or, or when it's raining, which is, you know, nearly all the time here in the UK. So I went out and got a plant propagation box. And what this is, is a big plastic box and you can plug it in and the, the bottom of it heats up. Not, there's no temperature control. It doesn't get super hot. It just warms up nicely. Um, so I used that method. I poured the peroxide into the base. I plugged it in indoors, put a UV light over it. And in fact, it was a full spectrum light, turned it on and over see that took three sessions so you know it took quite a while to do it indoors it's definitely better outdoors but the results were stunning it really did transform this very yellow keyboard into a very crisp new looking keyboard without all of the worries that you were talking about you know marbling is always a concern when you forget to rub the cream if you're using cream peroxide um, and cost is a concern it's not cheap to get liquid peroxide over here so in this method, because you only need to use a small amount poured in the base, it, it, the cost is far cheaper, as far as I can tell. And that's a big, a big pro for this method, I think. So it's a big thumbs up for me. The only thing you've got to worry about is uh, sort of condensation will form on the top of the box. And if you knock it, some of those drips might come down and you might unknowingly have a drip of peroxide on your thing for several hours and you don't really want that. So you want to look out for that and wipe it off if it happens. So yeah, thumbs up for me. The, the, the one thing I'm thinking, and this is, this is a method that tempts me and I am scared of doing this kind of stuff, um, but it's actually here. So I'll hold it up for the viewers and I'll, I'll describe it for the listeners, but this is my A1200. I've only got one A1200 because I don't hoard stuff. And um, it may look a bit yellower than it actually is for those of you watching on, on, on video, because I use a slightly yellowed light um, to light me up when we're doing the podcast. So the, the problem with this machine is it's it's slightly yellowed, it's slightly aged, but it's certainly not so far gone that it needs restoration. Does that make sense? In in, in essence, you could put the coloration of this machine down to patina and, and just carry on using it. But I'd quite like to experience an A1200 looking new, which is why I'm tempted to do this on this. But this machine now has sentimental value. I bought this off a friend, Godfrey, who sadly passed away um, earlier uh, in the year. And so I want to treat this case with respect. This this case has actually been um, passed around the Perth Amiga users group through um, a, a number of people, but it was Godfrey's original case back in the day, went through a number of people, including me, back to Godfrey, who ended up repopulating it with the board that's in it now, which he then sold to me. So I don't want to be the one to mess it up is what I'm saying. You know, this is actually quite an important machine. So, you know, I want to make sure I'm using a method that isn't going to mess it up. Yeah, you talk about wanting to treat it with respect. That's exactly why I wanted to try this method on the Amiga 1000 because it's such mm. it's the first A1000 I've got hold of um, and it's such an important machine to me. The last thing I wanted to do was mess it up. So this yeah. seemed like the, a low risk and turns out to be a highly effective method of doing it. So I would recommend it if or it, you know retro brighting is another great reason to buy just completely broken Amigas just for their cases. Get them cheap retro bright another one have a have a minty case and have your one with the patina alongside it you know? yeah that's another way of doing it and funnily enough godfrey was the kind of guy to happily upgrade stuff as well so if he was here we'd probably go i don't care what you do buy a brand new gray case yeah. it really doesn't bother me do you know what i mean but to me this this needs to be preserved um and it's now in a position where it needs to have a few things fixed the floppy drive needs um uh taken apart and, and greasing up and cleaning um there's a the H hard drive light doesn't work so i've got a new set of lights for that need to swap that over just a couple of other maintenance things that need to be done so now is the time to actually if i'm going to retro bright it to actually get on and do it so yeah i think it's the prime candidate um and yeah i think why i'm more comfortable with the contactless method um and, and you've touched on that neil is the fact that there is less chance of things like marbling and, and stuff like that um dave i mean i know sts you know they were kind of a, a dull boring gray from factory do you retro bright things at all does this method tempt you you're right sts were a beautiful color of gray from factory <laughs> if i knew uh here's the 
mega STE keyboard here. You can see it's a, this was actually a little bit yellowed. It does need a little bit of retro brighten. But again, this isn't just your standard 520 ST. So I'm not, I, I'm not really keen to just YOLO it. Um, <laughs> is, are we still using YOLO? Is, <laughs> Carpe diem. Is, I just need to ask, is that battleship grey or military grey? Do you know which one it is? Military grey. Military oh, grey. Fantastic, um, yes. Yeah, definitely military grey. Um, so they're not the kind of the, the, the dirty beige knockoff Amiga color. Um, now this method not only tempts me, but I am going to do it. Um, like other computers, like the Max, for example, there's dye in the plastic of STs, and that makes them really susceptible to marbling. So if you use the immersion method, which is the one that Neil talked about actually being quite expensive because you have to submerge the whole thing in peroxide or you have to dilute the peroxide, which makes it take longer to try and reduce costs, then you can't just do it until the yellowest part becomes what color you want because then every single part of it is losing the dye from it. Um, so you, you run the risk of going too far on it. And if you use the cream and cling fill method, then you have the, the big risks of marbling. There's two other methods we haven't mentioned. One is sun brighting, which is just leaving it out in the sun. And I don't like the idea of that at all. We know that we can tell by looking at old cases where the sunlight has hit them. That's where the, the, the process of yellowing has started. So I don't like the idea of just using nothing but sun to do it. And the last way is a, a, a relatively unknown one. I've not seen people talk about it. It's um, Noel's Retro Lab, which is the cream method, but he applies it with a paintbrush. And he doesn't cover it in cling film. He just comes back every 15 minutes, reapplies more cream and spreads it out and that I, presumably stops it marbling stops it concentrating in one area um i'll ask duncan to to to, to link that now I'm up for the way that Neil did it in his Amiga 1000 tra Trash to Treasure videos. As soon as I saw this link, I knew what it was talking about because I remember what I've watched. Um, now, but for what we've all we said about retro writing, it's important to point out that nobody really knows. And I do get mildly frustrated, perhaps more, mildly frustrated when people make assertions without any proof, particularly about what will be good or bad in the long term. We don't know. We don't know. So people that say this will happen, it does make it more brittle, or, or I've had this anecdotal evidence is not proof. So I've got my suspicions, but nobody really has proof. So all we have to do is keep an open mind, try it and make sure we report what happens. But as, th as things stand, I think this is the way to do it. Yeah, I would say the uh, the only drawback on this particular method is you're restricted by the size of the box. So with cream, you know, you're, you can have a whole reel of cling film and you can wrap something yeah. huge. With this, you're going to have to buy a box that's big enough. But, you know, if you're going to do this regularly, it's a small cost for uh, some, some nice I'd, results. I'd like to see you try it, Neil, on a Philips uh, monitor. You know, the 14 inch ones that we, we use in Atari STs and Amigas. Um, those often get get nasty yellow and submerging those is is not a good idea so i i'd like if you appropriate it big enough to see it done on, on that next time you do a trash to treasury involving a monitor yeah i have three very yellow um models of exactly that monitor all w waiting to be uh brighted in some way um they won't fit in the box that i've got so yeah i'll have to find a, a larger box to uh, put them in because you'd obviously decase them but even with that whole back bit taken off it's quite a tall thing uh but yeah i'll look forward to seeing what kind of results we get with that and that's the kind of thing that if it doesn't work out you can actually respray that quite easily a nice color so you know spraying is also an option if retro brighting isn't for you mm -hmm. uh, but yeah having had this discussion chris has your feeling changed at all about your 1200 what are you thinking no not at all i I, I feel quite comfortable <laughs> confident and it's the right way to treat this machine i think it's yeah it's, it's the right future for it i've considered some writing as well which i know you touched on dave but it requires just too many hours from my research and i'm loath to leave plastics in the hellfires of perth for too long i know the uk got a taster of what that's like um this summer i was actually there for some of it but you know that's just the norm for a Perth summer and I'm not even joking so yeah I don't want to do that so this this method with snakes and like spiders and with snakes and spiders drop bears, and drop, drop bears. <laughs> we both went for drop bears yeah and jellyfish and sharks and everything yeah, there's no escaping Kangaroos. um 
Yeah, but uh, I mean, from what I've seen, the results uh, for this no contact method, especially in the video from Macho Nacho Productions, uh, look very impressive after only six hours uh, of treatment. And of course, you know, your video, Neil, as well with the A1000, the unforgettable results uh, with the A1000. <laughs> um, so yeah, for me, this really is the most tempting method I've seen, uh, whether it's new or not. Uh, and I think that the risk of accidentally dousing myself in a corrosive bleach and ending up in the burns unit uh, other than that, um, it's something I could do without adult supervision. So do check out the link in the show notes. Don't have a cow, man. Bart reaches 50 with retro help. Uh, Dr. Local brings us a story this week that is not about Bart Simpson. Um, although he is definitely old enough to be retro and probably better off back when he was retro. Uh, this one is about Bart B-A-R-T and not B-A-T, the Atari ST Cyberpunk game, which I, I think it got a, an Amiga release, I'm sure, in DOS port, so you probably played it. B-A-T? What? No. Cyberpunk game? What? Neil? Oh, hello. Sorry. <laughs> was... Do you want to know what I was doing? <laughs> you were watching... I for work. <laughs> were you watching your own retro writing video? <laughs> going, I was Why downloading... Didn't... I was downloading Bart Simpson WAV files to play in your ear while you were talking. <laughs> do you remember? Do you remember BAT? Yes. Um, it was kind of a 3D game, Cyberpunk City. And you could yeah. fly around in your flying car. Yeah. Uh, was it a French company made that yes, one? Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. Interesting game. Not, not, not perfect, but interesting game. Anyway. It's nothing to do with that. Uh, it's BART, which is the Bay Area Rapid Transport. And there's no Simpsons link apart from the fact it's a monorail. The name's Lanley, Lyle Lanley, and I come from you good people tonight. No, it's not. It's not even a monorail. There's no there's no Simpsons link at all. It's two rails. Um, think of it a little bit like the London Underground, but not actually underground, so overground. Um, it opened in... <laughs> Carabunga, dude. Neil's playing some symptom samples, which will not, not will come out in the video. <laughs> Maybe Duncan can add that. Can we add Carabunga, dude? Can we? Maybe Duncan can add that. Uh, it opened in 1972. <laughs> Just back into the rum. Uh, it opened in 1972, and it's been extended over the years, and the last time being 2020, and it carries over 25 million passengers a year. So it's a heavily used form of public transport. Now, Neil, you seem too posh to use public transport. Am I right? <laughs> I love a train. I love a bus. I love public transport. Choo -choo. It's, Use the horn. It's, Choo -choo. Just, it's just the it's just the other people that are the problem. It's not the transport. <laughs> <laughs> am I am I wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so it is retro, but where's the retro computing link? Well, it turns out that it runs in a lot of obsolete parts. When it was created, according to the article at least, when it was created, it didn't use existing train technology. They went their own way and hired an aerospace company to build their fleet of trains. Although other train systems, and no monorails that I know of, were inspired by it. They didn't use the same technology, so it's become a bit of an outsider, which means the tech hasn't really moved on and there's, there's not so many replacements. And as a result, it still uses DOS. So that means that engineers use Windows 98 laptops, although hopefully they use DOS on the Windows 98 laptops rather than Windows 98 driving trains. Um, Neil, I know that in a previous life, life you worked selling popcorn in theme parks. <laughs> was that around the time when Windows 95 was, was around? Not quite selling popcorn, but um, no, I don't think in all of my professional uh, IT career, um, which is now, it's been such a long time since I actually worked in IT that all of my skills are now irrelevant and outdated. But even back then when I started, I don't think I ever used Windows 9X at all in a professional context. We were using NT4 when I started, and then there was still some NT3.51 kicking around on different systems. So, you know, and then that went to 2000 and that went to XP. So Never really. Sometimes someone would turn up with a Windows 98 laptop or a Windows ME laptop and demand that we make it work. But actually the pain of telling them, even if it was a big boss that you would get, you know, spittle all over your face when they, they showered you um, <laughs> with, with expletives for saying no, the pain of telling them to go away and get a company laptop and use what's issued to you was always better than the pain of trying to fudge 9X to work with the systems that you have and then support it. Um, especially as we came on to the, uh, the broadband era 
and you know it was just an open door to viruses and hacks and all sorts so no is the roundabout way of answering that for you dave fair enough well the trains are slowly coming to an end the existing fleet of trains is being replaced by a multi-billion new fleet uh, not a multi-billion f- new fleet of trains, a multi-billion dollars costing fleet of new trains. Um, and of course, that's coming with software glitches. They're having problems trying to implement that. So maybe DOS is better. Um, it does raise an important point, though. Chris, do you think in in closed ecosystems, like controlling a lathe in a workshop or a train or perhaps in a medical appliance where you don't, in fact, want it connected to the world, something where there's no real need to move on, where the technology is the same now as it was 30, 40 years ago, should we be paying to replace things with up-to-date systems or should we be trying to stick with the old tech if it still works? In short, yes and no. <laughs> um, but I, I want to take it back to the... Yeah, I want to take it back to the uh, the, the theme park um, uh, conversation firstly, though, because I remember one of the scariest moments in my life, because uh, I was an IT administrator, similar to Neil, uh, and our network, funny enough, we had NT4 servers, but the clients were Windows 95, I'm pretty sure. Um, and, you know, that, the network worked, it was fine, but obviously I dealt with a lot of blue screens and a lot of machines locking up simply because a talking paperclip was trying to tell somebody how to write a letter. Um, and so on one of my days off, gone to Thorpe Park, which is a theme park in the UK. Some of you may be familiar with, and I remember walking past the booth. We're in the queue, ready to get on this roller coaster, and seeing through the window uh, where, like, a twelve-year-old was running the running the show, or you know what seemed to be a twelve-year-old, um, and and seeing on the screen that it was running Windows ninety-five. And that was more scary to me than the ride itself. The fact that my life was quite literally in the hands of this operating system that I dealt with day to day that was not the most stable of environments. And this was the thing running the entire ride. And that freaked me the heck out. I can deal with going up and down the hills, round and round the corners that make you feel like the cart's going to fall off and all of that. But seeing Windows 95 being the thing keeping me alive, that was proper scary so yeah Yeah. anyway well i i should i should point out because um thought park was one of the uh, places that i worked at Ah, Um, okay uh well the company i worked for owned thought park at the end when i was working for them so Mm. they had their own it team i wasn't part of the on-site it team but Mm. i do know from working there and i think i looked after their backup servers there and things like that um the the systems connected to the rides uh, nothing to do with the internal IT department or internal IT systems. They're mm. provided by the people that designed the ride, supported, looked after by them. Not so disclaimers there, Neil. Well, well, you know, it's a completely separate thing, um, and and it's the right thing to do, isn't it? You want <laughs> you want the people who know the ride intimately, and surely those systems are going to be backed up by mechanical fail safes um, of one example if you've if you've ever been on stealth at thought park have you ever seen sometimes it doesn't quite give it enough power so stealth is a, a roller coaster that just goes naught to 100 or however fast really really quickly like two seconds then it goes straight up around straight back down again it's just sort of a really fast thrill ride but sometimes it doesn't quite give it enough power to get up that first hill it gets nearly to the top <laughs> and then it just rolls backwards with That's everyone serious. screaming but you know there are there are mechanical fail saves that must kick in to to help with them what's called a rollback um so i think even I if you even if you had uh windows 95 running and and it blue screened mm. i would like to think that there are mechanical fail safes that are going to stop that but i'm sure yeah, i'm sure there would i mean at the end of the day, it didn't stop me getting on the ride, let me put it that way. But it, it certainly gave me a chuckle, and it certainly gave me uh, an extra level of, of anticipation and fear. <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> Actually added to the experience in some ways that maybe some people uh, wouldn't, have, would have, wouldn't have had. So, yeah, it's quite cool. Um, but, you know, in terms of, you know, modern systems um, – yeah, well, sorry, the question that you actually asked, Dave, you know, if it's a closed system, I think I'd – yeah, I'd rather see them update the hardware to reliable hardware and a reliable operating system. So I do agree with bringing things, you know, into the present day. But I do wonder if, in some instances, there is the option to have it as an offline system rather than you know these constant and unexpected updates. Um, and also, you know, from a security perspective, surely it's it's better to have some of these things 
not on the line. I, I, I do agree. I, and I, I, I think uh, a fully up-to-date security patch system that's on the internet is significantly less safe than a disconnected system, even if it's still running DOS from 1995. If it's still running DOS from the Windows 95 version of DOS, it's probably safer that way than it is on there. But of course, you have the problem of old hardware. How do you replace it? And that's what the trains have. Yeah, I was about to say, it's not necessarily the operating system at that point. If it's been running for 20 or 30 years reliably, it's not going to start suddenly crashing when it's completely offline and nothing's changing that. It comes down to the hardware. But then it might have been um, virtualized and it might be running as a virtual machine somewhere. So, you know, you don't know. Um, and cash machines are another example. You often, you know, hear stories of cash machines running on old versions of NT and things like that, or, or Windows XP or Windows 98 embedded, you know, still running. Um, yeah, arguments for and against, but... Uh, cash yeah. machines have to be, by definition, they have to be connected to the to some right. kind of you would have thought. service. So, yeah, that yeah. you open up to um, exploits and overflows and all the rest of it. Now it's it's a great article. It really is worth a read. It's been it's been well written and it's peppered with hyperlinks the way the the web used to and should be, where little things to take you somewhere else to it. Uh, so it's a good way to spend a lunch break reading up on it. Um, don't have a cow, man. <laughs> It's time now for our community question of the week. Last week, we were talking about AI and AI generating art and all of that good stuff. And the question posed was, we were looking at how AI is being used to create art based on text descriptions and wondered what else an AI could be asked to create. Pick a game and then work out how you would describe it to an AI so the AI could create it. So an example might be, Sentient Egg explores fairy tale locations to rescue family, which would of course be Dizzy. Uh, and it's our job to guess the game. So we've not gone into the link. We've not looked at the questions. We've not looked at the answers yet, have we? We're going in blind no. to this. How are we going to do this? Are you going to guess and I'll read them? Shall we do yeah. that? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So I'll, I'll go with Is it a subject. competition between me and Chris? Yes. Yeah. Neil, you need to keep this on the line. Okay. You're going to get them I'm going to get none because I haven't Chris... played any of them. <laughs> Chris is half a bottle of rum deep, so he's got a natural not, disadvantage. This was the whole weekend. This wasn't today. <laughs> oh, interestingly, okay. um, interestingly, uh, some AI has been answering the question, answering the answers what? with AI images that it's created of the descriptions. So uh, Duncan can maybe show those as well. Oh, but cool. also, interestingly people haven't actually given the answer to the question, so they've described the thing, but we may still not know what the answer is. Okay, so the okay. first one comes from Rocky1138, and he says, a lonely spacecraft destroys hurtling rocks in futile attempts to survive. Asteroids. Its only wish... Asteroids. <laughs> its only wish is to destroy more than last time before death comes. Yeah, that's got to be asteroids. That's got to be asteroids. got to be asteroids. Um, and uh, that's the point to me. I thought it pop first. up on the screen, the AI generated art, which, um, yeah, there's a spaceship kind of flying across the surface of a planet, uh, and some some stars. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't look like asteroids, but it's done a it's done a, done a nice picture. <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, next one is from John Nick. Nineties racial stereotype, international martial arts tournament two. <laughs> Street Fighter oh, 2. Street Fighter 2. You think Street Fighter 2? Um, there could be more to combat. Well, Street Fighter 2. No, the answer is not there. So 90s. We're in the 90s, so IK Plus would be 80s, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, you could do. No, no, yeah, IK, IK Plus. plus is 80s. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I'm going Street Fighter 2. I'm yeah, sticking IK with plus that. Is 80s. Street, Fighter, Street Fighter 2, Street yes. Fighter 2. Street Fighter 2. <laughs> <laughs> How much iron oh, brew have you had, Which version Street Fighter 2? Street Fighter 2 Alpha, Alpha Turbo oh, Championship World War. Street Fighter 2 Turbo 10. Turbo Rainbow. <laughs> and then, interestingly, Rollhack. the AI has generated pictures of um, people that, for some reason, it looks like they've got um, feet for hands. They're, they're martial artists, but it looks like they've got kind of feet for hands. The second one, the description I, again? I, I don't even know what that second one has for a hand. It, it doesn't look like it's family friendly. Can you see that one? 
I haven't looked. I'm, we can't <laughs> click on the link, Neil. See. We can't click on the link, Neil. Perhaps, We're not perhaps allowed. Duncan will have to pixelate it. Oh, of course. Right. Okay. Um, here you go. I'll pop it in the show notes for you. There you go. There's a link to the um, okay. 90s yeah, Racial Series International Martial Arts Tournament. So, Chris, the second guy on the right, what has he got for a hand? Where, where In the first image? The, the second image. So there's four What's images. going on there? <laughs> I don't know how to describe that, and I won't. What? So, so that one we think was Street Fighter Two. Uh, the next one comes from August um, August Omino Jar. <laughs> Sorry, I'm absolutely massacring your username. Um, and they say wannabe pirate. So this is relevant to, to okay, uh, Pirate Week. Let me finish. I've started, so I'll finish. Wannabe pirate on imaginary single-named Caribbean island embarks on an epic and humorous adventure. Monkey Island. It's going to be Monkey Island. And um, the nice. AI has generated some nice pirates. Nice. Um, one holding up some fish, I think, in front of a boat. There's a cartoony one. There's one. Yeah, not good, good AI pirates. Um, should we do a couple more just because it's yep. um, yes, quite a fun so topic? Well, it's 2-1 at the defeat, moment, Chris. isn't it? Is it 2-1 at the moment? Would we say that fairly? Okay. Quick fire round. Famous archaeologist teams up with former flame Indiana Jones. to search for ancient cities submerged underwater. And the fate of Atlantis. Oh, okay. damn. <laughs> um, Would so you have that one? That's 2 all. No, I wouldn't. Oh, I was going to go Laura. Well, how, are you two all? how are you getting points when I get it right? Oh, because, okay, because I got him first. Hit. So I clearly here's I win. One, <laughs> here's one to end on. Here's one to end on. This is from... Is this a decider then? This yes. is the decider from Guybrush Loves Tesla. Come on. Scientists build robotic ninjas to take down a corrupt government in a dystopian future. Oh, while Syndicate. While listening to Daddy Mulk. <laughs> while what? listening to Daddy Mulk. I'm going to go Syndicate anyway. I would have said Syndicate as well, but it's not right. Uh, you Peter remember Moe? where Daddy Mulk came from. Why do you not think it's I, I, right? I could Google Why do you not think it's right? I don't know. It was, um, I'm, I'm it was an arcade game. It was an oh. arcade game. It had th three monitors. Oh, no. oh Boggy Boy. No. I don't know. Scientists I... build robotic ninjas to take down a corrupt government in a dystopian future. Robotic ninjas. You don't, you don't remember an arcade game where the ninjas, when you got beaten up, they started to spark and it turned out they were robots? No? No! Double Dragon no. 2. Double Dragon 3, no. Rise of no. the Robots. Don't it's not. <laughs> the listeners are going to be screaming it. right now. How do you oh. not know this? Who's out of misery? It's uh, Ninja Warriors. Oh, damn it. Is it? Okay, okay so we need, another, we need yeah. another one. Is there any more? <laughs> You're a tiebreaker. Okay. Yeah, we're on a tiebreaker. Okay. Um, <laughs> a foxy card game for the boys. Maria Whitaker strip poker. Teenage a, Queen. A foxy foxy card game. There's a for foxy the boys. coming in. Foxy. I've I've submitted my answer. <laughs> I don't I don't know where the foxy comes in. It's got to be Sam Fox. Oh, oh of, course. of course! Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh no, another tiebreaker then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm not. I'm not a trip poker uh, fan. <laughs> I'm just a Maria Whitaker fan. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here we go. Man takes his blonde girlfriend out for a spin in his Ferrari along many different oh, highways at high speed trying to avoid other motorists. I was in first. I heard Dave first. Dave is declared oh, the winner. Oh, I didn't even hear Dave. Oh. <laughs> was his mic muted? <laughs> Thank Damn you, it. everyone, for submitting them. That was a lot of fun. I wish no, I could have played quick. that. <laughs> there we go. You would have won, Neil. To be fair, you would have won. Maybe we need to do like a quiz or something at Christmas. That would be um, good. Well... It's a good thing because we're coming up to our one hundredth show, so we've got uh we've got this three week break between shows, so it's a good time for people to to to, to give us suggestions on what what they'd like to see for the hundredth show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there have been suggestions of a live show and all sorts, but um yeah, we'll see what we can uh, come up with uh, based on your suggestions as well. What's technically possible to get us all together live, if if it is indeed possible, um or what else we could do. 
So um, look forward to that. Um, we now need another question of the week. So if you would like to submit any stories for us to discuss on the show, head over to reddit.com forward slash r forward slash this week in retro. Any new stories um, that you post will be considered for our, uh, our three shows, uh, our three shows, our three stories. Um, you've got plenty of time. You've got three weeks to submit stories and we will look across the whole range of anything submitted over the next three weeks um, for consideration. And um, we better have a meaty question of the week, haven't we? Question of the three weeks that we can come back to. Mm. Um, so, okay, it's more a challenge than a question for you this week and you'll find this challenge uh, pinned uh, in, the, in the subreddit. So we've got three weeks, so let's give us all something, something substantial to do. Next time you're in town, pop into a charity shop, go to a car boot sale, go to a thrift store, whatever it's called in your part of the world. And you don't necessarily have to buy the thing, just get a photo of the thing. What's the best retro related thing, secondhand thing that you can find in a shop? Post a picture of it on the subreddit. Um, the three of us uh, will take on the challenge as well. We'll see what we can find. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess a... Um, What's that TV show called where they, they, they sort of try and find the best bargain thing in a charity hunt. shop? But bargain hunt. Bargain hunt. A retro bargain hunt. See what you can find. Um, and then we will give Dave an orange uh, spray tan uh, to, to be our David Dickinson <laughs> and assess the results <laughs> at the end of the next show. As always, good luck, um, bargain hunters. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Take care. Um, Chris is knocking back the rum. And we'll see you next time on This Week in Retro. Arr, see you in three weeks. <laughs> Bye. Bye. This Week in Retro was presented by Neil from RMC The Cave, Chris from 005 Agima, and Dave. It was produced by me, Duncan Styles. The podcast version of the show is available through your favourite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r slash This Week in Retro to suggest and vote on the stories we cover on the show. If you watch This Week in Retro on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you enjoy our show and would like to support it, then please check out the link to our Patreon page in the show notes or description. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.